Hey everybody, so this is the first video in the more scientific aspect of language and linguistics. And to start off with, I figured why not explain what exactly is linguistics, since most people I encounter when I tell them I'm a linguist or that I study linguistics, they're not exactly sure what that means or what that entails, even my own family to this day, after all these years. So let's get started with the definition, let's say, of linguistics. Which generally, if you find, if you look somewhere up online or in the dictionary, linguistics will be described as the scientific study of language, which pretty much is in a, in a nutshell. But what exactly does that mean? What is the scientific study, per se, and what exactly is language? Well, in the next video, I'm going to be talking about the differences between language and, and dialects and accents. Um, if you haven't already checked out the accent tag that I've uh, posted on YouTube, the link will be provided for you, so you can have a more informal look at that. Language was studied for several thousand years. It's not a new study per se. Uh, in its current form, it's definitely more modern, but it started out thousands of years ago with the ancient Greek philosophers. Um, at least that's the earliest that we can attest to it because of, of the just the fact that you document history through different writing systems and that's what's available. Uh, but if you look at the Greek philosophers, you look at uh, Plato, you look at Aristotle, they discuss th different theories of mind and theories of philosophical theories that deal with language. And later on, you hear of grammarians, pretty much a grammarian is someone that studies grammar of different languages. The most well-known in the Middle Ages uh, in 1492 was Nebrija, he was a Spaniard, that documented Spanish grammar. Um, it's really the first time you see a standardized, united, united um, understanding of a grammar or of a language. And then you have philologists, which were more popular in the 1700s, 1800s, particularly in, in England, in the UK, and in uh, Germany, you have lots of philologists which studied the evolution of language. Not necessarily the evolution, but his the history of different languages. And that was where you have the first talks of uh, the so-called Proto-European language. Uh, you, you hear discussions on different language families, how languages are related to one another. You know, English is a Germanic language. It's related to modern-day German, as well as Swedish, uh, Dutch, uh, Norwegian, so on and so forth. And all of those languages came from a common ancestor, which came from another common ancestor uh, of other European languages, such as the Romance languages, which sprung forth from Latin, uh, Greek, Albanian, Armenian, uh, the Slavic languages, many different families, Hindi, um, as well as Urdu, Persian, those are all Indo-European languages, hence the name Indo-European, India, Europe. That's not to say that all European languages are, in fact, Indo-European, but we'll get to that in another video. How the language study was approached in the past. Let's fast forward to the 1900s, the beginning of the 20th century, where you have anthropologists that are studying how different communities and different cultures are using language. And that's where you get the very famous Sapir-Whorf uh, hypothesis, which just discusses how different languages, different cultures, use languages differently and how that language shapes thought and if certain concepts can be expressed more readily or easily or at all in certain languages and not in others. Um, and that from that discussion led on to even more. And then you have Chomsky in the 50s from MIT, who he's still going strong there. He is considered the father of modern linguistics and influences, uh, besides his political uh, texts on um, anarchy and anarchism, is universal grammar, which he discussed people who are physically capable of producing speech, language, have inside their brain uh, a universal grammar. It's essentially your brain is equipped with all of the right tools to learn any language at birth. There's nothing innate about somebody who was born in Japan 
or in the United States or in Turkey or in Uganda with a, uh, a chip that's only programmed for that specific language. It's not ethnicity bound. It's not uh, racially bound. It is a universal grammar. So your body, your brain can learn essentially any language. So language can be studied in many different ways. Science has different branches and subcategories. Linguistics is the same. Apply linguistics to many different things, to many different studies, to many different uh, types of research. It's one of those central areas because everybody talks. For the most part, everyone that is physically capable of producing language um, is something that we don't really we don't really think about, we kind of take for granted speech and and all that that talking and listening entails. So let's let's look at linguistics as a spectrum where you have the hard theoretical uh, or conceptual aspects of linguistics, which has the kind of the building blocks, so to speak which entails phonetics and phonology, is probably, let's say, the backbone. Or if you're building a house, if you want to use a house metaphor, you have it's the foundation. And then you have, from phonetics and phonology, you have morphology, you have syntax, then you have semantics. And then after the house, you have pragmatics, and that has an offshoot to a bunch of different things. So let's briefly discuss each one of those. Uh, phonetics and phonology, as the name suggests, phoni is the Greek word for sound, for voice, um, and it deals with how sound is produced. Phonology deals with how different languages allow for certain sounds. That's why Spanish does not sound necessarily the same as French, which does not sound the same necessarily as English, which does not sound necessarily the same as uh, Mandarin or Swahili, for instance. These languages have different phonological rules, processes, that allow for certain sounds to be produced, either vowels, consonants, so on and so forth. Phonetics deals with either the acoustic properties of, of producing sound, the articulatory process, how you actually use the different organs to, to create those sounds, um, and, and how different phonetic phonological rules apply in specific contexts, what sounds people believe are actually being produced versus what other people are interpreting and hearing from them. You have morphology, which is the kind of in between phonology and syntax. You have that middle layer or, or hub that connects the two fields. So morphology comes from the Greek word morphos, which means shape or form and it deals with the formation of words, different components of words. So you have prefixes, suffixes, roots, you have compound words, you have different processes that different languages allow for, and that has a lot to do with the sounds that the language produces, which would, again, go back to phonetics and phonology. And then it also has to deal with the organization of the different words together, which leads us to syntax. So syntax, again, comes from Greek syntaxi, which means order, classification, class, and it deals with the structure of, of sentences for the argument's sake. So certain languages allow for uh, the subject to always come first, then the verb, then the object. English is an example of that. M many languages are subject, verb, object. Um, but then there are certain languages like Turkish, like Japanese, which require the verb to come last. And it doesn't make sense if you have the verb prior to uh, the noun, for instance. And many languages have lots of flexibility with that. But then there are languages that require adjectives to come before the noun that they're describing. Like English, it's a tall, he's a tall man. But then in Spanish, again, there's some flexibility, but generally the adjective comes uh, after the noun that it's describing. Uh, el libro viejo, the old book, is the book old in their syntax, in their structure. Again, there's usually, even languages that are much more rigid, they tend to have some flexibility as well.
semantics, which, as the name suggests, it comes from Greek again. Simasia means meaning, so semantics deals with meaning of words, of sentences, and you can approach semantics in different ways. Uh, as an undergrad at Rutgers University, they were very, very theoretically oriented, so it's very uh, in tune with formal, is often what they call formal semantics, which deals heavily uh, with logic. Um, if you studied philosophy or certain math uh, disciplines, you have uh, set theory, and it deals a lot with that. In this possible construction, in this possible world, this could potentially mean this and this and this and this and this and this. There's a lot of possibilities. And then you can also approach semantics in a more context-driven way, which leads us to pragmatics, which is essentially meaning and context. And pragmatics in of itself has a lot of interaction with different subdisciplines of linguistics as well. Because pragmatics deals primarily with context, uh, that leads us to other disciplines. Now, you can take all of the previous elements that we discussed, phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, and apply it in different ways. So applied linguistics is essentially using those previous categories to teach language, whether it's a first language, whether it's a foreign language, whether you're talking about bilingual education, bilingual matters. And that's how you have a huge field of both language acquisition. You have neurolinguistics, psycholinguistics, which are different um, disciplines regarding how the brain and different organs work together to create the understanding, the departmentalization of language. Uh, your brain has different hemispheres. It's generally associated with the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is generally associated with language, both learning and speaking. Uh, there's different other regions, Broca's region, uh, Wernicke's re region, so on and so forth. And making mistakes in speech. Uh, cognitive sciences deals a lot with linguistics. You have you have all of that. Then you have, like I said earlier, application or applied linguistics, which is applying all of that from phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and to a certain extent, language acquisition into the classroom, into teaching uh, both young, both children, both adults, men, women, different communities, different cultures, different ethnicities, uh, either their first language, or often called uh, your primary language or your maternal language, as well as a second language, an L2, or so on and so forth. And there's different reasons behind it, either for business, for immersion, and so on and so forth. And then you have other disciplines, such as sociolinguistics, which is what my specialization was. You have sociology of language, which is kind of a yin-yang relationship, whereas sociolinguistics deals with, more with how social contexts and constructs affect language. Sociology of language is how language affects different social constructs. Kind of goes hand in hand. You can't really study one without the other. You have linguistic anthropology, which is kind of how modern linguistics got its start um, and led to all the other more formal or theoretical aspects. But you can also have linguistic anthropologists who study different communities. They deal a lot with ethnographies, and discourse analysis a lot of the time, which is you know transcribing how people talk and different uh, communication strategies, so on and so forth. As you can see, there's a lot that you can do with linguistics. Within sociolinguistics, you can you can concentrate on lots of different things. You can deal with how younger people talk differently than older people of a specific group. Um, any form of linguistic variation which leads us to dialects and other uh, designations, which we'll talk about in another video. You can deal with gender, you can deal with uh, how there are... You can either talk about it just in terms of how they speak differently and, and categorize it that way, or then, and then you can progress on that, you can add upon that. So then not just the differences in linguistic variation, but then you can also talk about how those changes or how those differences play a role in society. And what I've studied had a lot to deal with different language styles and how people understand and value people that talk similarly or differently from them. Language policy, whether or not 
there should be an official language if your country or state has an official language or not. Um, bilingual education, whether or not there should be uh, programs geared towards learning multiple languages. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with linguistics, and I've only scratched the surface. I know this was very brief, but because this video is already going much longer than I intended it to, uh, you can find a lot more information. You can go into lots of different websites. Um, I recommend the Linguist List. Uh, the Linguistics Society of America is also very uh, useful. Then most linguistics departments at different universities will have additional information. I'll put some links in the bottom so you can read, do research, but also feel free if there's any questions. If I didn't answer anything that you were hoping for, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to answer you as soon as possible. Also, look out for more videos I'm going to be releasing in the future. Um, one of those I'm sure will answer some of the questions that you have uh, down the road. Anyway, thank you very much and. Ah!